Hey, welcome to Cross Shop. My name is Chris, and today we're kicking off the first installment in a series where we can reflect on our favorite gaming memories. The global situation we're contending with right now has all of us mostly confined to our homes, and that confinement has caused lots of us, myself included, to play more video games than usual. My first one. Yes. It's also had me thinking a lot about the earlier, simpler times in my life, when games were scarcer to come by, my gaming interests were formed, and this god-awful Tomb of the Dragon Emperor Mummy movie didn't exist. <coughs> Although I'm not a parent, I see tons of people walking around my neighborhood, taking their kids outside and playing with them, and it makes me remember when I was 10 years old, playing whatever video games I could, and never wanting to go play outside. I mean, look at me. In any case, I'm going to kick off this series by cycling through my all-time favorite gaming memories in chronological order, starting with the first full decade of my life, when I was old enough to understand what a video game was, from 1990 to 1999. As best as I can remember, my first gaming memory is actually a shared one between Super Mario Bros. 3 on the Nintendo Entertainment System and Mortal Kombat on the Sega Genesis. Allow me to explain. The year had to be 1993 or later, because I distinctly recall playing both of these games with an older kid named Ryan at his parents' house, and 1993 is the year that Mortal Kombat made the jump from arcades to home consoles. I was probably four or five years old, and I had never played a video game before. I remember playing Mario 3 and being awestruck by the bright colors, the bouncy, catchy music, and by how fun it was simply to jump. I think Ryan also showed me the first Super Mario Brothers, but I was too impressed by Mario 3 to want to waste any precious time at a friend's house on the older, more primitive version of a game I was already enjoying. After playing Mario for a bit, Ryan insisted that he could show me Mortal Kombat and asked me to have my character stand still so he could show me some special moves. I didn't know what special moves he was talking about, but I'm sure it only took two rounds for him to have knocked me into the pit or ripped out my spinal column. I could not believe the things I was seeing on the screen. The violence and cartoonish fountains of blood were insane, and when I agreed to let Sub-Zero be finished off by one of Liu Kang's fatalities, I'm sure that I shrieked with shock, delight, and gas. So yeah, Mario 3 and Mortal Kombat were the first two video games I ever played, but the first one I ever owned was the Tiger Electronics Mighty Morphin Power Rangers handheld. When you get the game, you've got the power. Tiger's new Mighty Morphin Power Rangers handheld game, you can pulverize the Putty Patrol. Yes! Now they're mud men. When you've got the power, you can pound that pig. Take that, pork chop. And give Goldar grief. Huh? Yeah! It's Morphin time! Your Megazoid Mash! When you've got the power... I've got Rita's wand! And I've got a headache! You've got Tiger's Mighty Morphin Power Rangers handheld game. I probably got this annoying little thing in 1994 or 95 for a birthday or Christmas. It seemed really cool to me initially, and I played it a lot, but my interest in it waned pretty rapidly. The buttons on it actually became painful to push over time, so the farther you got into the game, the more your hands and thumbs wore out. At some point during the year or so that I regularly played the Tiger game, I got to play Tetris and Super Mario Land on a friend's Game Boy. From then on, the Power Rangers handheld kind of seemed like a beeping box of mediocrity and hand cramps. I abandoned the Tiger altogether when I finally got my own Game Boy sometime in 1995 or 96. By this point in my life, my family had moved to a new state, and we spent what felt like a lot of time in the car. Most of our vacations were trips around the Midwest to see family, or a rare trip down to Texas or Florida. We'd pile into our Chevrolet Astro van, and each of us would bring along some kind of entertainment to pass the time. For me, this meant music on a Walkman, or later on my Sony CD player, a couple of books, and my clear Play It Loud Game Boy. I'm sure I got that Game Boy as a Christmas or birthday gift, much like just about everything else in those days. And with it, I got one game, an arcade classic combo cart of Galaga and Galaxian. Although Galaga was the only thing I had to start with, I did my best to beg, borrow, and buy as many new games as I possibly could. The cool thing about getting a Game Boy when I did was that it already had a really impressive library of games that had come out in the six or seven years before I even owned one. Within just a couple of years, I was confronting those long van rides head on with new games like Kirby's Dream Land, Pokemon Blue, Super Mario Land, Donkey Kong, Monopoly. Oh, you're Monopoly for Game you're Boy! Next Monopoly! Perfect. That's gonna be good. It's Monopoly. That's great. Donkey Kong Land 2 and Turok Battle of the Bionisars. 
Some of those trips in the mid 90s brought us to my newlywed aunt and uncle's house, which much to my surprise, became a Super Nintendo oasis for me. My aunt owned an SNES that she brought to my uncle's house in 1997 when they got married, and she owned Super Mario World, Super Mario Kart, and a handful of other games that I'd dabble with. I was excited any time my family made the five-hour drive to their house because I knew it meant I'd get to play at least a couple of hours of the most amazing Mario games I'd ever seen. Those trips to play Super Nintendo were nice, but obviously too short and too infrequent to satisfy my hunger for 16-bit adventures. Thankfully, back in my hometown, I also spent a lot of time with Jordan, one of my best friends up through about fifth grade. His padre was the principal at our local high school, so we sometimes got to play basketball in the high school gym and run around the halls in the dark like idiots. Jordan also owned both an SNES and a Genesis and a nice amount of games for both. As was pretty common at the time, we usually go to the local video store and rent a couple of movies, a couple of games when we were hanging out over the weekend or over summer break. I have good memories playing Sonic the Hedgehog and Aladdin on Genesis, and Donkey Kong Country and Zombies Ate My Neighbors on Super Nintendo. But the most specific memory I have from that time was one specific weekend when Jordan had both me and our mutual friend Aaron over to spend the night. Aaron told us he'd been playing a game called The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening for a while, and he said he felt really sure that he could beat the game that Friday night. Jordan owned a Super Game Boy, so we put Aaron's cartridge in it and watched him take on the final challenges within Level 8 Turtle Rock and confront the multiform nightmare within the Windfish's egg to finish the game. Just as I had been astounded by Mario 3 and Mortal Kombat four or five years earlier, I was completely fascinated by Link's Awakening. It was the first Zelda game I'd seen and I couldn't shake off my desire to experience the game and its world full of secrets myself. Fortunately, I was able to get my own copy of the updated full color DX version sometime after its release in 1998. That was the first Zelda game I ever played and it remains a favorite today. Now, during those formative years, another good friend of mine named Bob, who remains one of my closest to this day, showed me tons of games during the countless times we hung out during the mid to late 90s. His family lived closer to mine than any of my other friends at the time, and our moms were in a bunco club together, so I'd go over to his house for an afternoon or to stay the night, and we'd pretty much play video games until our brains became a mushy porridge and our eyeballs liquefied. <laughs> The main games I remember us playing back then were Gex and Crash Bandicoot on PS1, and a bunch of PC games including Duke Nukem 3D, Deer Avenger, and Lego Island. And as I mentioned in the Resident Evil Collection and History video I made, Bob introduced me to the survival horror genre with Resident Evil Director's Cut in 1998. I'll link that full Resident Evil video in the description below, but suffice it to say, I owe Bob a debt of gratitude for his help with kickstarting my longtime fandom of games and movies of the macabre variety. Easily the biggest turning point in my gaming history since learning that Mario and Scorpion were not the names of two murderous tattooed mechanics working at AutoZone was the Christmas of 1997 when the Sony PlayStation entered my family's home. Thankfully, my dad captured this monumental event in my life on film, and if you want to see me as a dorky eight-year-old happy child in the onesie shouting testimonials for Sony PlayStation and Crash Bandicoot, click up here. With the PS1 now safely under my own roof, I had my first home game console, and I became a pretty loyal PlayStation fan from then on. 1998 is remembered by millions of geeks like me as one of the absolute best in gaming history, and for many reasons. I didn't get to most of them until at least a few years later, but in 1998, games like Half-Life, Resident Evil 2, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, Spire the Dragon, and Medieval came out. The Dreamcast was announced and Rockstar Games was formed. That year stands out most in my mind, however, for being the year of both Metal Gear Solid and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Listen, I know these are obviously two of the most well-known, dead horse beaten video games of all time, but when I think about things like how new and captivating the cinematic approach to Metal Gear Solid's storytelling was, or how useful something like the Z targeting system was in Ocarina, and how the influence of those games is now apparent in countless games we've been playing every year since 1998, it makes perfect sense why these two games immediately made such an impact on so many people. For my part, at that age, I'd never played anything remotely like Metal Gear Solid, and the only Legend of Zelda game I'd played before Ocarina was still just Link's Awakening. I've long since lost track of how many times I've played through both of these games and they honestly served as a perfect capstone for the first 10 years of my life in video games. Like I mentioned, this episode is just part one of my favorite gaming memories. So if you enjoyed this video and want to talk more about game history, game collecting, and frankly, anything in the world that isn't the mummy Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, please subscribe and watch another cross chop cut or two right here. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, and as always, play heavy.